morning. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning, and I welcome you in Jesus' name. Welcome to you who are participating online, and whatever shape you are in this morning, good, bad, somewhere in between, you are welcome. It's really important to me that um, it's only the voice of Jesus that you hear in your lives this morning. So in Jesus' name, we invite the fullness of your spirit, Holy Spirit, to meet us, encourage us, strengthen us, and reveal yourself to us. In your strong name, we silence all other voices, that of ourselves, of others, that of the enemy. Speak to us, Jesus, we are listening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. It's Epiphany Sunday. It's a Sunday when we celebrate the revealing of Jesus to the Gentiles through the account of the Magi, or the wise men as we sometimes call them. In some parts of the world, they celebrate this day by taking a bath in the icy waters of the frozen lake. And that's super tempting to me, but we are not gonna do that here this morning. Whenever I think of the Magi, it's hard to get past their representation in Sunday school Christmas pageants. They have, hands down, the best costumes. And the three kids, usually boys, who get to wear those glamorous costumes, well, gosh, what could be better? They rarely have any lines. They look fantastic with their beautifully bedazzled headgear, richly colored robes, carrying gifts with names they could barely pronounce. The whole package somehow communicates this, well, maybe tacky at times, but still magnificent, exotic splendor, kings. Sometimes, though, the wonder and the mystery of the account of the kings is lost in our portrayal of them at Christmas time. That familiar carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are, with its unfortunate slide, oh, star of wonder, maybe leads us to think of them in comic ways. This morning, I'm going to lead us to consider together the significance of the Magi, the significance of Epiphany Sunday and what was being revealed to them and now to us. Epiphany means a moment of sudden revelation or insight. I had an epiphany. I suddenly understood. It also carries the sense that something that was hidden is being revealed. As Corinne mentioned, Pastor Terry is back with us next week. Yay! And thank you to all of you who have been shouldering the extra work of the ministry in his absence. You know who you are. You know what it cost you and your families. And we're grateful. Starting next week, we will be in the book of John. And this beautiful gospel is all about epiphany, all about Jesus gradually revealing who he is. For us in our part of the world, dawn comes slowly. The morning comes gradually. The shadows dissipate. The shapes of things become clearer and we can see. At the equator, dawn breaks. It's dark and then it's light. Epiphany is more like that, dark and then light. So what was this epiphany that the wise men are signaling for us? Please turn in your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading the first 12 verses uh, of his account of this prophecy-fulfilling event. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you comes a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report back to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. 
When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a kid at school, math was not my strong suit. It still isn't. And math word problems were the worst. You know, Johnny goes to the store to buy six yellow apples, three green apples, and two red apples, and he has a whole classroom of kids he's meant to share them with. Invariably, I would get stuck wondering about the boy who was sent to the store to buy apples. What if he drops them? Will he get in trouble? How was he going to carry them home? Was he by himself? How old was he? Who was going to cut them up? The teacher? And who goes to the store only to buy apples? This is sometimes how scripture lands for me. I have so many questions. How far did the wise men travel? Did they have an entourage with them? Did they ride camels? What's it like to ride a camel for days on end? What was the weather like? Did they get sick along the way? How did they feed the camels themselves? Were they afraid of being robbed? The wise men had a different question, a good question. Where is the one who was born the king of the Jews? There are a few things from this count that I would like to briefly consider, and then I'm going to move to what epiphany can mean for us. First, there are some crazy things going on here. A new star announces some wealthy foreign astrologers that a new king has been born, so they saddle up and ride, carrying some precious cargo to go visit a very ordinary woman in a very ordinary place with her baby. That itself is a lot. Amazing. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? The Magi went first to Jerusalem. Now this would be the sensible place to find a new king. Jerusalem was the religious, social, and political center for the Jews. But that's not where the new king was. God did not cause Jesus to be born in Jerusalem. He was born in a place like Cayley, Milo, Arrowwood. He was born in Bethlehem, a no-account place on a no-account road. God's kingdom is a wonderfully different kingdom, and he delights to interrupt the ordinariness of our lives with his extraordinary His power surpasses the banality of political power. It is complete and uncorrupted and present in the most unlikely places, places like Bethlehem and places like here. The scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law missed it. Herod was jealous of it. The wise men recognized and embraced it. God delights to interrupt the ordinariness of our lives with his extraordinary. Second, this epiphany, this revelation was heralded by an extraordinary celestial event, a new star. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. To try to understand this a little better, I reached out to Dr. Stephen Jeans at Ambrose University. He's our knowledgeable and enthusiastic lecturer in Earth and Space Science to get some insight into stars and their formation. And here's what I learned. One, the formation of stars requires time, lots of time, like thousands of years of time. Two, it takes years of time light years of time for the light from any star to reach our ability to see it. Three, the formation of stars requires intention, divine intention. God, in his magnificent omniscience and power, foresight and planning, laid the design for that particular star long, long, long before the wise men were able to see its light. This extraordinary star led them to Jesus. And I just have to say, wow, that makes me bow and worship with them. Third, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. 
and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. This prophecy-fulfilling event drew a variety of responses. Yesterday on the Lectio 365 app, which I love, Sarah Yardley put it this way. Matthew describes three different reactions to the news of Jesus' birth. There's the disturbance felt by the political elite. King Herod, appointed by the Roman Empire, saw Jesus as a direct threat to his throne. Then there's the complacency of the religious leaders, the chief priests and experts who had all the needed knowledge but missed the moment of Jesus' arrival. And finally, there's the attentiveness of the outsiders, the magi who saw the arrival of Jesus signposted in the stars and traveled far to worship him. Fourth, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. The wise men were overjoyed at seeing the star, this long ago planned for and prepared sign from God. They were not just joyful, they were overjoyed. I got interested in how the Greek rendered it, and it reads like this. They rejoiced, Cairo, exceedingly, sphodra, with great, megas, joy, kara. God made us with emotions. We are meant to feel things and experience things. When the goodness of God, with the extraordinariness of God, some provision, some sign from him, when he bursts into our ordinary with his extraordinary, it's more than okay to get a little crazy and express that. Experience that. Do a little Tim Cordyce happy dance. A good litmus test can be this. Consider something in your life that you get really excited about. For me, it's when um, Jordan Love, quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, lays in a beautiful pass to a receiver in the end zone, and there's a touchdown. I'll get up, shout, clap, celebrate. Jesus, though, infinitely more exciting than the Packers, should get more than that from me, yeah? Fifth, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Magi, because of their difference, their being entirely other from another culture and place, signal for us at this very early juncture that right from the start, Jesus was meant for everyone. Everyone. He was not only the king of the Jews, he was their king too, and the gifts they brought foreshadowed Jesus' true identity and mission. Riches for a king, incense for a priest, and myrrh, and embalming oil for someone born to die. Sixth, and being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. God spoke to the Magi in a dream. In a dream. Now, we tend to treat our dreams as manifestations of stress or poor evening night lunch choices, and sometimes they are. But let me just say, pay attention to your dreams. It may be that God is speaking to you in that way. It is well documented throughout Scripture that he does this. If you have a dream that seems significant in that God kind of significant way, treasure it, consider it. Maybe seek out some counsel regarding it. Okay. When I was first approached about preaching, the Lord impressed something particular on me for us today. The idea of epiphany, that the epiphany that the wise men had as it relates to Jesus and to us, who is Jesus to me, and I mean experientially, what is his effect in my life on who I am and who I see myself to be? All fall, we've been considering who we are as a church, and then in Advent, who is the one we are waiting for, and what does he bring to our lives? I want to bring these ideas together now and talk for a couple of minutes about our identity in him. We have entered a new year. Happy New Year! We have new calendars, 
and a new set of days. And here's the thing. We do not use an old calendar for a new year. God in Jesus announces a new day for us. The clothes that we were wearing, the identities that we were bearing before we invited Jesus into our lives are, because of the death of Jesus, those things are dead. His resurrection and the new life we gain from his life means that we have a new identity, a new name. We are reborn and are now children of God. Our identity is child of God. We habitually take our identity from what we do. I'm a writer, a mom, a wife, a grandmother, like that. I'm a teacher, or a bricklayer, or a prof, or worse. We take our identity from the negative things or lies that we believe about ourselves. So for example, dumb is an identity that I will often carry around concerning myself. I'm not good at dot, 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 fill in the blank. I'm flighty. I'm too much. You know, she's just too much. Maybe you have a few of those things too. Things that you think about yourself, others think about you or have said to you, maybe over and over and over again. In Jesus' name, I'm inviting us this morning as we enter into 2024 to shake those off. Those false identities, those grave clothes, they are grave clothes for dead bodies, not for the children of God who are filled with Jesus, redeemed by Jesus, fully alive in Jesus, restored in Jesus, equipped by Jesus, adopted by God into his family as a joint heir, a joint heir with Jesus, seated in heavenly places with him, a child of God, created with love and intention, with purposes that are specific to each one of us. There is divine intention in our differences. We struggle sometimes in our identity because we think we are supposed to be like someone else, that they, whoever they are, are the best version of a person. If only I could, if only I was. You, me, the way God is shaping us is the only important thing. Let him be the one doing the shaping, not culture, not social media. He creates us differently from one another according to his good purposes and pleasure. We miss this sometimes in the church and in our wider culture, and we want everyone to think and act and do things the way that we do. This is not God's way. Your father has a purpose for you. And I bless you in Jesus' name with knowing and embracing his purpose for you. Some years ago, God gave me a simple little tune that I sometimes sing over myself, over my children, over people I'm praying for, and it goes like this. Shake off the grave clothes, shake them off. Shake off the grave clothes, shake them off. They don't own you anymore, shake them off. They don't own you anymore, shake them off. I invite you, in Jesus' name. Shake off those grave clothes, those old identities, those lies. Let's not take them into this new day, into this new year with Jesus. Do not waste your time and wreck yourself and others by agreeing with the enemy about who you are. He lies. He lies. These pathways in our thinking can be worn very deep, and it's easy for us to slip into the ruts. The First Nations version of the New Testament renders Romans 12, 2 in this way. Do not permit the ways of this world to mold you and shape you. Instead, let Creator change you from the inside out and the way a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. He will do this by giving you a new way of thinking, seeing, and walking, and then you will know for sure what the Great Spirit wants for you, things that are good, that make the heart glad, and that help you to walk the path of becoming a mature and true human being. A new way of thinking, seeing, and walking. How practically speaking do we do this? 
It's not hard, exactly, but it does require intentionality. When you find yourself thinking in ways about yourself or others that do not line up with what Jesus says you are, you say out loud or to yourself, no, in Jesus' name I rebuke those lies. Go where Jesus tells you to go. I am a child of God, chosen by him and for him, beautiful in his sight. And renew your mind in this way, in the image of Christ, as we are his image bearers. You are not what you do, and you are not the sum total of your faults. Who are you in Christ? You are a child of God, adopted into his family, a joint heir with Jesus. You are created by him, for him. You are loved, forgiven, redeemed, seated in heavenly places. You are gifted, chosen. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. You are loved, you are loved, you are loved. Isaiah prophesied, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Let's come with those wise men to that dawn today. I'd like to invite the worship team now to join me on the platform. And we're going to turn our attention towards the communion table now. The communion table is this beautiful, redemptive space of the service where we get to remember all that was accomplished for us on the cross. Salvation, healing, redemption, the restoration of our lives, in dying on the cross and rising again, Jesus once and for all and forever defeated death. That is our final enemy. And in defeating death, he defeats everything that stands in the way of his kingdom come up to and including death. So we, we remember his death and all that was provided for us. And in eating the bread and in drinking the cup, you were confessing your faith, your belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now...